We notice it anymore because we don't use sails unless you happen to be a sailor, you know, have a small, a small sailing boat or something like that. But most people now use motors that don't depend on the air, so they, don't, they are not as attuned to the winds. But back in Columbus' time, being a, a commander of a ship meant knowing the winds, meant really getting to know the winds at a personal level. Columbus took the trade winds and the trade winds brought them to America. But the trade winds only circulate in one direction. So to get back to Europe, he had to sail away from the trade winds into another circulatory pattern called the westerlies, which flow in the opposite direction, and that's the way he was able to get them back to Europe. So circulatory patterns, wavy patterns of air, have played a role in our history. Uh, perhaps an even more influential wavy wind or periodic wind, or as they call it technically, convective wind, is the monsoon. The monsoon, you know, normally one thinks of the monsoon as a rainy season, but it is in fact the monsoon is the name, the proper name for a specific circulatory pattern of air that blows throughout Southeast and Southwest Asia and has been blowing there for centuries. The monsoon is different than the trade winds because it goes clockwise six months of the year, counterclockwise the other six months. So sailors needed to learn to deal with the monsoon to go in one direction. They knew they had to wait in their destination for the monsoon to change direction and then they took it on its way back. Sailors had to respect the wind. Sailors had to learn about the self-organized patterns in the atmosphere because that was their livelihood. They needed to know about water, they needed to know about air, and they needed to know, however indirectly, about intensive differences. Because without the intensive differences, there would not be wavy patterns. So, wavy patterns or periodic patterns of flow emerge at a specific point of speed or a specific point of temperature too. And then if you keep increasing the intensity, there is yet another intensive threshold which transforms it into turbulent. Turbulent flow is even more interesting because it's fractal. It's vortices within vortices within vortices. It's eddies within eddies within eddies. It's much harder to understand, much harder to draw. Again, and yet, uh, 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 Leonardo has a very beautiful, and, and other painters, of course, is a famous Japanese print of a wave in which you see the wave with different scales of the, of the vortices. Artists have understood the beauty of turbulence because it is a beautiful way for things to flow. It's not a simple circulatory pattern, it's one in which vortices at different scales are creating something much more complex. For us humans, turbulence is mostly a nuisance. You know, the pilot says, you know, uh, everybody, please back to your seats, you know, fasten your seat belt because we're going to go through some turbulence. And it's freaking out when the pattern, you know, when the plane is being buffeted by vortices outside, and then finally we go into the calm part and, whew, you know, we didn't explode. But turbulence is beautiful. Turbulence is a specific form that emerges spontaneously at a critical point of intensity. There are many other of the sequences. I'm not, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to write them down. I'm just going to tell them to you. For instance, many materials can be insulators of electricity, such as rubber. And that's why we use rubber and, and, and similar plastics for the outside of cables. And other materials like copper and other metals that are conductors of electricity. And you, you, we use them for the inside of wires and cables. But being a conductor or being an insulator is also like this. One and the same material at very low temperatures can be a conductor, then go and become an insulator, and then, I'm sorry, begin as an insulator, then become a conductor, and then become a superconductor as you lower the temperature. So, insulator, conductor, superconductor is another sequence, another intensive sequence. Animals, which are now, of course, much more complex creatures, also develop these phase transitions, but now with respect to the gates they use to move. Think, for instance, of a horse 
which is, you know, quadruped, quad, quadrupeds have more variety of gates, as, they, as, as it's called, of ways of walking or ways of moving than we bipeds, so I'm going to use a horse as my example. At very low speeds, a, a, a horse can move by walking. But if he wants to go a little faster, he needs to break into a trot. If he wants to go even faster, he needs to break into a gallop. The sequence walking, trotting, galloping is also like this. You know, the breaking, the, the, the change from one gait to another occurs at a specific point of speed. You can test that with yourselves when you go, when you go outside. Try to walk, and then try to walk as fast as you can. You're going you're, you're gonna to realize that there's a point of speed beyond which you cannot go if you keep walking. It doesn't matter how fast you're trying to go. There's a limit of speed. You can go beyond that limit of speed if you break into a run. That is, if now you start using different muscles to propel yourself. But if you stick to walking, there's a maximum speed. After that speed, after that critical point of speed, your body needs to change into a walk, into a run, and then you can and then you can go faster. That's another intensive sequence. Now let me let me just draw one more here. Oh, it's not a little too low, but let me see if I can squeeze it here. Oh, maybe I'm just going to go to another pitch. What the hell? One more, one more point to make about intensive differences. They are not necessarily deterministic. Let's think of the sequence vapor or steam there. Liquid water. Snowflakes. It's the same sequence as before. Gas, liquid, and solid. But when liquid water meets this particular phase transition, as this as this intensive thresholds are called, it now has a choice. In quotes, it can become the relatively boring crystals seen in ice. When you look at ice under a microscope, it's made out of hexagonal shaped water molecules that are repeated exactly the same over and over and over again. It's a repetition of the same pattern, and that gives you ice cubes, or ice in general. But when you look at snowflakes, they have the same hexagonal symmetry, but the little dendritic growth in their little arms and so on is so complex that all that it is it is, is well known that every snowflake is different from every other snowflake. I mean it's very, very hard to get two snowflakes, compare them and go, oh look, they're identical. In other words, liquid water can freeze and form a solid that is relatively boring, in which there is repetition of the same, or it can it can uh, uh, solidify in another form where there is repetition of difference. This is the repetition that the Lus has in mind when he writes a book called Difference and Repetition. Not the repetition of ice, the boring repetition, but the repetition of snowflakes. Snowflakes are creative, in, in, in quotes. They, are, they, they express the possibilities of nature and the expressivity of nature in an aesthetic way, because when you see many snowflakes lined up in front of you, you go, how beautiful they are. Yeah. Even though they all have hexagonal symmetry, in some the dendrites are growing in a particular way. In other words, there's dendrites within the dendrites. In, other, in others, there's just a hexagonal shape with some beautiful pattern in the middle, they display this